to the webinar. Um, if you're new to this technology like I am, um, I am going to read us some instructions. So uh, let's get this out of the way. Hold on to your questions until I've um, finished the instructions and then hopefully everything will be clear for you. So welcome to the webinar. You should be hearing me and seeing me, first of all, on a split screen with me on one side and my PowerPoint slides on the other side, or it might be top and bottom, depending on your computer. Um, if you're hearing me but you're not seeing me and my slides, then that means you're connected to the webinar but you have the wrong window open. So you need to either close your other windows, or if you click on the daisy icon at the bottom of your screen, that will bring you into GoToWebinars. At TZK Seminars, we want to provide the same quality continuing education experience that you would get when you go to a live talk where you can ask questions of the speaker and leave at the end of the day with your training needs met. But of course, we're using webinar technology. This makes our seminars less expensive and more convenient, but we don't want to sacrifice quality, of course. And fortunately, there's no reason that you can't leave today's webinars with your questions answered. You have two ways to ask questions. The first is to type them. So on your control panel, there is a large box with a space at the bottom that says questions. So you can click on that box and type a question, click on send, and then I will see your question, only me. The rest of the audience doesn't see your question. So I'll read your question out loud and then I'll respond to it. You can also ask questions verbally by clicking the raise my hand button and that's located at the bottom of the narrow strip on the left-hand side of your control panel. So when you click the raise my hand button, you'll, uh, I will see, hopefully, that you've done that, and I'll unmute you. You can ask your questions out loud, your question out loud, and then I'll respond. Now, it's very rare, apparently, but possible that we might develop a bad connection. So if you lose sound quality for more than a few seconds, I need you to type that into your question box and click send. And it is important that everybody does this because if just one person sends me a message saying that they've lost sound quality, I'm going to assume that it's just their bad internet connection. So everybody needs to do this. And if I get messages from people, multiple people telling me that they have a bad connection, then I am going to end the webinar. But don't panic, we're not, we're not finished. Um, and so what we'll all do then is click the webinar link the way we did several minutes ago to join the webinar in the first place and hopefully when we reconnect, the connection will be better. And fortunately, I'm told this is an unlikely event. So you should be seeing a split screen with me on one side and my PowerPoint side slides on the other. You can adjust the size of those images by left-clicking the bar between them, holding the clicker down, and dragging the bar one way or another. Okay? If you prefer to see just me or just my slides, then you can move the, the bar all the way across. Uh, also, when you purchased the, the webinar, you were emailed a receipt with the link to the webinar, and underneath that link is a link to my PowerPoint file. You can click the, on that link to the, open the PowerPoint file, and you can save it to your hard drive. You can print it out or do whatever you'd like with it. But I've also placed the PowerPoint slides in the handout section on your control panel. So you can open the handout section uh, from there as well and click the PowerPoint slides file open from there. So, I think that's it. Hopefully that makes sense for everybody. I see, oh, somebody's practicing putting their hand up, so. <laughs> okay, so um, I think I'm just going to tell you guys quickly a little bit about myself. Um, and sorry, if it's, uh, I hope that you can see me okay. I know it's a little bit dark in this room where I do my webinars. Um, it's rainy out today up here in Ontario, Canada, and so it's not a nice, bright, sunny day like I wish we would have. But anyways, um, I'm Sherry Van Dyke. I'm a social worker. I live up here in Canada. And um, I have been using dialectical behavior therapy as part of my practice since I started in my career. Um, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the different perspectives that I bring to um, DBT, and that is from the um, community hospital that I work at. So I work in a hospital where we're working with um, adults, so eight, 17 and older, really, we work with at the hospital clinic I'm at. Um, we're an adult mental health outpatient unit in the hospital, and uh, we're called the Brief Therapy Clinic. I'd like to emphasize that just because right away you know that I am familiar with resource-limited um, agencies or environments. 
So brief therapy clinic, we have a maximum of 12 sessions to work with clients on an individual basis. So I work with individuals there with severe mental illness, so major depression, anxiety problems, uh, bipolar disorder, and we also do group work there. So I run a group for our uh, clients with bipolar disorder, and I also run a group that we call the Emotion Regulation Group that's meant as a discharge group for people who are being discharged from our inpatient unit. So um, just coming out of that acute phase of, an, of any kind of illness, it's a transdiagnostic group. Um, however, the, the flip side to this is that I'm also working in private practice, and so of course lots of flexibility there in terms of how long I work with people and that kind of thing. Um, so I do not work with children. Um, the teens I work with are 16 and older. Um, we do also do a little bit of couple therapy, but I do not consider myself very, um, it's, it's outside of my comfort zone, let's put it that way, to do couple therapy, but I do it because I have to, uh, using DBT skills as well. And so I just like to kind of give you um, an idea of, um, you know, the context that I work in so you know my um, experience in using DBT. And the thing is, I use DBT with every client that I work with in one way or another, okay? So this tends to be a little bit different with um, uh, a different perspective that I take than other therapists who use DBT and that I'm really looking at skills um, and strategies and techniques from DBT uh, and using those things with clients without borderline personality disorder and that's been the emphasis of my work. Okay, so I would like you to ask questions as we go along, please. This is a new webinar for me as well, so, um, I think it's only the second time that I've done it, and the timing seemed to be okay on it. So I'm going to ask you to ask questions as we go instead of holding on to them till the end. Sometimes I might put them off if I know that that's coming up in the presentation. We might defer a little bit, but I don't want people leaving here without their questions answered. All right, so let's get into our slides. Um, what we're going to be looking at this afternoon, again, are the core mindfulness skills of dialectical behavior therapy. So we're going to review the states of mind, we're going to look at the what and the how skills, and throughout we're going to be looking at ideas um, to help you teach these skills to your clients, and talking also throughout in terms of um, how these skills are going to help our clients with just general emotion dysregulation problems. And by the way, I always like to emphasize in my workshops that I use these skills myself. And so it's not just about teaching skills to our clients, it's about learning to use these skills ourselves and how they help us to manage emotions more effectively. Just, you know, even if it's just regular plain old stress that everybody experiences or uh, grief when a relationship ends or you lose somebody that you love and those kinds of things, okay? So these skills really are helpful um, just uh, in living more contented, happier, healthier lives. So the four modules in DBT I've just outlined here. Today, as you know, again, we're doing the core mindfulness skills. Um, there are also interpersonal effectiveness skills, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance skills. And these are the modules that you would be doing if you were running a DBT group. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that when we're doing um, DBT in individual work, often, if you're like me, you're a clinician who's not working in a DBT program, a pure DBT model, where clients are attending individual as well as group at the same time, and so we kind of have to improvise, and that means teaching clients skills in our individual sessions. Um, and often that works perfectly, perfectly well. And when we're doing that, though, we don't have to go through each and every skill in each and every module. We're able to pick and choose what skills are going to be most helpful for the client that we're working with, depending on the issues that they're experiencing. Mindfulness, however, um, is a skill that I teach every single client that I work with. Um, and there's, of course, different ways of teaching mindfulness. Um, I often teach mindfulness in a more general way, not necessarily using all of the DBT core mindfulness skills. And so keep this in mind that if you are already teaching your clients mindfulness, um, you can continue do, to do that in whatever way is comfortable for you, but learning these skills that we're going to talk about today kind of opens up more options for you. It gives you more ways of teaching mindfulness. And I'll probably, I think I touch on that as we kind of go along um, in terms of giving you some ideas around when you might use, for example, observe and describe instead of teaching mindfulness as um, in that more general sense. Hopefully that'll make sense as we go along. So don't worry if, I, if that wasn't completely clear. 
Now, I've got a couple of slides in here that we're not going to go through. I just kind of tucked them in at the beginning in case you weren't familiar with the terms that I'm using. So uh, you might hear me mention formal mindfulness practice and informal mindfulness practice. And so those definitions are there in case you don't need them. Um, uh, sorry, in case you do need them. <laughs> um, and so ideally, though, we want our clients to be practicing mindfulness in both a formal way and an informal way. Um, so with daily activities throughout their lives that they would be doing and possibly, you know, doing mindful breathing practices or mindful body scans and those kinds of things, okay? So I just kind of wanted to put that out there at the beginning of the presentation. Again, if you're already teaching these skills to your clients, and if you're not, then you can certainly just start incorporating the DBT skills as we're going to learn them this afternoon. Remember, though, the importance of practicing yourself. Mindfulness is a really um, complex skill. Even though um, uh, the ideas behind mindfulness might seem fairly straightforward, when we put them into practice um, and we start looking at the ins and outs of mindfulness, it's really a very nuanced um, skill. And so if we're not practicing mindfulness ourselves, it's really difficult to respond to problems and questions that clients have as they're learning about it themselves. Um, so I just like to really emphasize that. Okay, so the core mindfulness skills in DBT um, is a set of skills uh, that, just like mindfulness, we're looking at helping our clients to be more aware of what's happening in the present moment. Um, to we're, um, we're helping them to become aware of when they're not living in the present, when they're living more in the past and, and the future. Um, and bringing acceptance or being non-judgmental about their experience. Um, so a lot of our clients spend a lot of time thinking about the past, thinking about the future, and typically there's a lot of emotional pain when we're not living in the present. So um, one thing that I'll ask my clients to think about is what, when they're living in the past, uh, or first of all, are they living in the past a lot? Do they notice their thoughts going to the past a lot? And if they are, what kinds of emotions can they identify that often come up for them? And typically people can identify that uh, they're feeling sadness or regret or anger and those kinds of emotions. And flip side to that, of course, being the future. Um, if they're living in the future quite often, typically it's anxiety, but of course lots of emotions can come up around the future as well. So the core mindfulness skills is about living more often in the present moment, this moment right here, right now, and practicing acceptance with whatever we happen to find in the present. So it might be accepting a physical sensation, so for example, chronic pain, um, working with clients with chronic pain, mindfulness is super helpful. Um, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, my train of thought there. Um, so anyways, when we are uh, being living more in the present moment and practicing acceptance, automatically our emotional pain is going to decrease. Even if um, there is pain in the present moment, as I like to say, the present is, isn't always pleasant, right? But even if there's pain in the present, being just in the present, as we would be with mindfulness, means that we have less emotional pain because we aren't bringing in the pain of the past and the pain of the, of the pain of the future. We're just having, in other words, pain times one instead of pain times three. Okay, and then of course, being more accepting of our experience um, also reduces our pain because we're not getting angry with the judgments and the non-accepting around that experience, whatever it is. Right, that's where I was going. It could be a physical sensation, it could be a thought, that's uncomfortable or an emotion that's distressing for people. Um, and it's also, remember, of course, about um, external things, things that are external to us that we might be mindful to, right? So it could be being mindful, accepting of the weather. Uh, it could be um, being accepting of um, other distractions in our environment. Whatever it is in the present moment, um, practicing that acceptance part is going to help reduce our emotional pain. So the first um, set of skills in the core mindfulness module of DBT is the states of mind. Uh, the, so the diagram that you see here demonstrates the three states of mind that everybody has, okay? Nobody doesn't have a wise mind. Everybody has a wise mind. Um, now the clients that I tend to work with typically spend a lot of time in emotion mind, which we're going to talk about shortly. But sometimes people get stuck in reasoning mind or rational logical mind as it's um, called here. 
So reasoning mind is where we'll start. When we are in reasoning mind, we're just using our logical, straightforward, uh, rational thinking. Okay, we're thinking facts. So, um, for example, if I'm making a grocery list, I'm just thinking factually. I'm looking through my cupboards, I'm looking through my fridge, I'm making a list, which is usually reasoning mind when lists are involved. Um, following instructions to bake a cake, that would be reasoning mind. You're measuring things out, you're reading the list and you're following the directions and so on. So when you're in reasoning mind, there are no emotions involved. Or if there are emotions, they're very small, they're on the back burner, and they're not influencing your behavior. Okay, that's the difference, or the important part. So um, now I think of reasoning mind as being, well, and uh, actually both of these states, as being on a spectrum. Okay, so as you can see from my examples here, hopefully uh, you can see that we all need to use our reasoning mind at times, right? So uh, I need to make a grocery list if I'm following directions to get to a place I've never been before, or I'm following my GPS to get to a place I've never been before, that's going to be my reasoning mind. Um, so we need that reasoning mind, there's healthy reasoning mind, but as we kind of go over in the, on that spectrum and we move into unhealthy unreason, reason, reasoning mind, um, it might look like this. So I have a client, or had a client recently in my bipolar disorder group, who uh, mentioned in group one day that she knew she was in reasoning mind uh, too much, she was too far there, when her partner would start telling her that she was being cold. Okay, so that was kind of her cue um, to realize that she wasn't connecting enough, she wasn't letting the emotions in enough, and that was causing problems in the relationship. Okay, so that would be a step over into unhealthy reasoning mind. Then if you think further over though, think um, the diagnosis that always comes to mind with this would be something like Asperger's, right, where people really ha struggle with that um, social connection where uh, they're not able to connect really with others. Um, it's difficult for them to put themselves in other people's positions and empathize and those kinds of things, right? And then of course further over on that spectrum and really unhealthy reasoning mind, we get um, you know, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy and those kinds of things where there is no emotion. There is like not even the capacity for that, right? So um, the, the last thing I'm going to say about this skill, I do see a question here, I'll just finish this part off. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say rather about reasoning mind is that um, uh, these, all three of these states of mind actually are going to be different for everybody. Okay, so um, for me, I mentioned making a grocery list is reasoning mind for me, but if I'm working with a client who has an eating disorder, then we're probably not in reasoning mind territory anymore, moving into emotion mind, okay? Or for somebody who has anxiety around driving, if, uh, so for me, again, reasoning mind is following my GPS instructions to get to where I'm going. For somebody with anxiety around that, um, that's going to be, again, moving into emotion mind territory. Um, oh, okay, Kara was having sound qualities, but it looks like that's okay now. Thanks, Kara. And you just reminded me I better check those questions sooner in case we have those sound problems. Thank you, Kara. Okay, so that is our uh, reasoning mind. Whoops, wrong direction. Our emotion mind, as I mentioned, emotion mind tends to be where I see the majority of my clients um, spending a lot of time. And this is the part of them that gets them into trouble most often. The key with emotion mind, emotion mind is not when you are feeling a feeling. Emotion mind is when the feeling that's there is controlling your behavior, okay? So you're no, you're no longer in control, um, the emotion is taking over, and it's like that knee-jerk reaction. Um, it's you're just acting on urges at this point. So for example, you're feeling anxious, typical one with anxiety is you feel anxious and you avoid what's causing the anxiety. Or you feel angry and you lash out at whoever's closest to you, okay? So those would be some examples of emotion mind. Um, but it, emotion mind also includes the pleasurable emotions. So think, um, well, so I mentioned my bipolar disorder group, so we always have this discussion in the bipolar group that emotion mind for clients with bipolar disorder can be the hypomanic episodes, right? So while hypomania obviously isn't an emotion in and of itself, think about the excitement, um, 
uh, feelings of joy, ecstatic, being ecstatic, all of those emotions can come up when somebody's in a hypomanic episode. Um, but let's also normalize this a little bit because, again, using these skills ourselves, there are times when people without mental health problems are also going to be controlled by emotion mind, right? So um, when my dogs uh, are barking really loudly and I'm trying to have a phone conversation, I might yell at them. I might lash out a little bit. That's emotion mind taking over. Okay, or um, when I get really excited about something. So I got some good news a few months ago. I'm going to Australia this summer. And uh, so when I found out about my Australia trip for work, I started calling my friends and my family to let them know my good news. That's emotion mind, okay? So it's really helpful when we can teach our clients these states of mind, normalizing them and giving lots of examples. One thing with DBT is we use a lot of, of self-disclosure, especially when it's related to skills. So I would use exactly the same um, examples that I'm telling you guys. I would bring um, into my sessions, either individual or group, and I would share those personal examples. That was emotion mind. When I got my good news and I started calling all my friends and family to share it, that's emotion mind. I'm posting on Facebook or whatever, right? So that's really helpful uh, to kind of bring our, that part of ourselves to sessions. Okay, so the thing with um, the states of mind, it's not that we are trying to get rid of reasoning mind or emotion mind. Hopefully you can see that we want and need both of those states. Emotion mind, by the way, let me back up for one second because often our clients will say, well, can't, like, why do I have to have an emotion mind? Why, right? It's, uh, how is it helpful? Emotion mind is helpful, first of all, because we don't want to miss out on those pleasurable opportunities and experiences. But even when the emotion that's there is painful, that's what helps us connect to others and empathize and bring compassion to others because we've been there and we know how difficult those emotions are. So yes, emotion mind, even when it's painful emotions, it's still helpful. So we're not trying to get, trying to get rid of those states of mind, but we want to be able to find a balance between them more often. And this is where our wise mind comes in. Okay? So wise mind is the combination of three things. It's our reasoning mind plus our emotion mind. So we're able to experience our feelings and we're able to still think logically. And the third component is our intuition. Now what we mean by intuition in this regard is really um, the sense of just knowing. You know that you, everybody knows, I've never had anybody who doesn't know this, just that feeling inside of just knowing that this is the right thing to do or this is the healthiest thing or the most effective thing for me to do. So this kind of involves um, like often an unconscious weighing of consequences, possible behaviors with their possible consequences and outcomes. Okay, um, And thinking about what is in my best interest. And why is mine though isn't just about me, it's um, acting from my values. And so wise mind is also going to be um, what's in the best interest of other people maybe that are involved in the situation. So what's in the best interest of this situation in a, in a general sense, myself included, but also thinking about other people. So you know that you're in wise mind when you're thinking about the con consequences of your behavior, um, acknowledging the emotion that is there because emotion is part of wise mind but you're um, choosing how you want to respond in the situation instead of just reacting, okay? So remember, reacting is emotion mind. That's the emotion mind response, is the behavior is being controlled by the emotion. So wise mind is making a conscious choice, uh, including the emotion, so taking that into consideration, but not based on the emotion. Uh, Terry's just mentioning at your school for at-risk teens, we teach stop, think, decide. Yeah, yeah, so that would be wise mind. Um, so, sorry you guys, my slides aren't moving. Uh, so a couple of exercises that I like to do in group that help people to kind of get uh, these three states of mind um, more into their brains, basically. One thing that we do, and actually I think we'll do this very quickly, I want you to, and I won't read through all of the responses, but get your fingers ready to type. Um, I want you to think, first off, reasoning mind, 
what is an occupation that for you represents reasoning mind? So when you think um, reasoning mind, this is a stereotypical occupation that you would see as belonging in that category. Accountant, yes. Uh, okay, doctor is an interesting one, Kara, and my response to that has become, I think it depends on what kind of doctor. Okay, so we'll talk more about that, but yes, actually Emily is saying surgeon, and I would definitely agree, with, I would want my surgeon to be in reasoning mind. Uh, lots of accountants, engineers, yes, uh, scientists, yes, great. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and actually I'm going to quickly go, sorry, somebody has their hand up here, Suzette. Suzette, I am taking you off mute, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Suzette, are you there? Okay, I'm thinking that Suzette's uh, raised hand was maybe an accident. So I'm going to take her off. Oh, I'm going to take her off mute, but now Suzette has disappeared. Oh, there, there we go. Suzette, can you hear me? Oh my god. Did you have a question? Okay, I'm assuming Suzette doesn't have a question. So Suzette, I've taken you off mute. I apologize if I got that wrong, but you can type a question in there and bring my attention back to you. Okay. Um, uh, yes, banker. Uh, oh, yo, sorry, Suzette. Suzette's saying I said banker. I didn't. I couldn't hear you there, Suzette. So thank you. Okay, banker definitely. Okay, good. So I'm going to stop there, you guys, and I want you to do the same thing now, but though with um, emotion mind. So what is uh, kind of the epitome of emotion mind when you think occupations or careers? Just type a response in there. Actor, yes. Artist, yes. Good. Anything else? I'm getting lots of actors and dancers. Okay, Pam said social worker. I was waiting for it. Typically somebody says social worker, and my response to that is I hope not, actually. And you'll see why in a minute, Pam, when we talk about wise mind. But I would hope that a social worker would be in wise mind. Uh, writers, yes. Monica said teacher. I would say the same thing about a teacher that I would hope, and also a firefighter, Jared saying. Um, those guys I would hope would be in wise mind. Firefighters might even be in reasoning mind because they are so well trained that everything is muscle memory. And so they just go through the motions, essentially, I think, for the most part, right? Uh, okay, this is an interesting one. Um, Amaya says lawyer, and uh, I think I would say it depends on what kind of lawyer. I think stereotypically many of us think trial lawyers, right, where they're very, um, I don't know, angry and uh, I, I don't, I guess passionate, right? So I would think that that kind of lawyer would be emotion mind, yeah. Okay, so last one is uh, what would an occupation be that would represent wise minds for you? Okay, so judge, yes. I think Francis is saying therapist, yes. Um, psychologist, yes, Pam, social worker, right? So think about it this way, you guys. Psychologist, of course, yes. Oh, a mom, yeah. Uh, although I think a mom would probably bounce back and forth between uh, all three of these, but, but yes, definitely. Motivational speaker. So, yeah, therapist. We want to be in our wise mind because, of course, we're going to have, and Monica, now teacher, of course we're going to have emotions with the clients that we're working with, right? Um, but we don't want those emotions controlling us. If I'm a puddle on the floor with my client, I'm not going to be much help to them, right? Okay, uh, Joshua is saying a forensic pathologist. I would, <laughs> that's very specific. Uh, I would think they would be in reasoning mind quite often, so I'm not sure if you're still maybe on reasoning mind, but uh, or, may, uh, or maybe I just don't know enough about forensic pathology. Maybe they are wise mind, but I think forensics, I think um, reasoning mind. Okay, so that's it's just a nice quick exercise that you can take your client through. It makes things a little bit fun. Um, Oh, okay, Terry's clarifying wise mind. Her husband's in the fire department and he has to leave emotion and only be in wise mind. Okay, but if he's leaving emotion, then that would be reasoning mind versus wise mind even, Terry, I would think. Right? So 
the difference between reasoning mind and wise mind, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay, good. So the difference between wise mind and reasoning mind would be that in reasoning mind, the emotion isn't really included. It's not involved in the experience. So if it is there, the person's pushing it away. Okay, so we're going to leave that, you guys, and go on to uh, really, really quickly. Um, uh, the other exercise I'd like to do with this is, uh, now I've got here t who's a TV character that represents each of these states, but I've learned to broaden that a little bit. I need to change this slide. I want you to think famous people, okay, because I'll have clients in group and they'll give me like their favorite uh, soap opera star and I don't know who these people are. So think characters, think famous people, think pop culture, who everybody is likely to know, okay, who would represent, what character or person, famous person would represent reasoning mind for you? So yes, Renee says Spock, absolutely. Stephen Hawking, yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the Office, uh, Richard, but Richard is saying Dwight from Office. Spock. Oh, I vaguely remember Monk. Einstein, perfect. Sherlock Holmes, perfect. These are the kinds of responses you want to get so that your clients know who these people are too, right? Okay. So let's do emotion mind. Um, I think I saw. Yes, there it is. Donald Trump, right? Somebody's got to bring him up every time. Okay, so who else would be what um, emotion mind for you? Jim Carrey characters, yes. Anybody else? Emotion mind? Nobody else is coming up. Okay, I'll give you uh, one of my favorite emotion mind people is the Incredible Hulk. Okay, uh, and actually I forgot um, so Spock was mentioned for reasoning mind, and I'll just also mention the other pop, like really popular person that gets mentioned is um, Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. So most people know Sheldon, even if they don't watch the Big Bang Theory. Uh, but yes, Kara's also saying Robin Williams. I miss him. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now this tends to be a little harder. Most people struggle with this a little bit more. Uh, wise mind. So famous wise mind people. Somebody already said Oprah. Yes, Oprah's, Francis is saying Oprah again, good. Anybody else who falls into that category? Justin Trudeau, okay. Um, I would probably agree with that, actually. I, I'm just wondering now if Pam lives in Canada. <laughs> um, okay, so Suzette said the president. I'm assuming you're not meaning the current one, although, sorry, that was a big assumption, and I hope I didn't just offend anybody. <laughs> Morgan Freeman, yes. Mary Poppins, good one, Renee. I've never thought of that. No, yeah, Gandhi, the Dalai Lama. Okay, so Pam's saying that you're you're Canadian. Okay, Obama. Yes, good. Um, and again, I'll give you my favorite one for this is Yoda. Yoda. Okay, so um, okay, so there are some examples for you of those three states, and uh, just again a couple of nice exercises you can get your clients thinking about. Okay, I'm just going to finish this off with a couple more slides here. Um, that often clients confuse emotion mind and wise mind. Okay, and part of the reason for this, or probably the reason for this, is that both include an element of emotions, right? So wise mind and emotion mind both involve experiencing an emotion. So often people might think that they are in um, wise mind, but it's actually emotion mind still. The key here is in emotion mind, the feelings are more intense. And remember, they're controlling the behavior. Um, there's often also a kind of uncertainty, a flip-flopping back and forth between if it's a decision people are trying to make, they're flip-flopping back and forth between one, one decision and the other. That is emotion mind. With wise mind, there's a sense of being at peace or feeling calm or feeling that rightness about the decision. And it's important to help our clients practice getting to their wise mind. Emotion mind can often trick us into thinking it's wise mind. Remember, emotion mind is what feels like the right thing to do quite often. It's, it's what we want to do, it, so it does feel right in that sense. But when we can get our clients and ourselves practicing tuning into our internal wisdom, often we can see uh, what the actual best thing is for us to do, the most effective thing is for us to do, 
Okay, but this does take practice. And so here are uh, some examples of how we can get our clients practicing turning into their wise mind. Um, so my favorite practice for this is um, just asking my client, so we're having a conversation, I have this one particular client who does this quite frequently, she has this habit of asking me, what should I do, what should I do? So she lays out the situation and then she'll say, tell, like, tell me what to do. Um, and my response, and she asks this with a smile on her face knowing what my response is going to be, and that is, what does your wise mind tell you to do? Okay, so now what she'll do when I ask her that is, I see, so her eyes will either go down or she'll kind of look up, she looks away, and that's her way of turning inward, okay? Or she might sometimes close her eyes as well if it's a really tough decision. So she, she turns inward in some way, and then I can see her taking a couple of deep breaths, and it's like she's just waiting and listening for it. And then usually, I would say probably like 95% of the time, she's able to give me an answer as to what her wise mind tells her to do. Sometimes, if it's a really tough situation she's dealing with, sometimes she'll say, you know what, I just don't know right now. My wise mind isn't giving me an answer. And that's okay. Then it's about, then I'll have her do other skills, like maybe do a pros and cons chart or do some exercises to help her uh, to find the answer. Um, but at, just asking that question, most clients can actually give us the answer as to what their wise mind tells them. Now, the trick with that one, by the way, is that uh, when she gives me an answer that I don't quite uh, agree is a wise mind decision for her. I can't tell her that my wise mind knows better than her wise mind and so she's wrong. Okay. What I do is I question her about it. I'll say, okay, if you tell me that's your wise mind, I'll take that, but are you really sure that that's your wise mind? And then actually usually she'll say, no, that's not my wise mind. She, so she'll be able to acknowledge that. Okay. Wise mind isn't always the easy thing to do or the thing that we want to do. So it can be hard to acknowledge what wise mind says if it goes against what we actually want. Uh, the example here that I'll just give you is um, with that client. Um, she's been in sort of a relationship, but it's been a very chaotic relationship. And uh, they haven't, neither of them have been sure if they really want to commit to the other. So they actually decided to take a break. And she said that she knew that was what she needed to do. Even though she knew it wasn't what she wanted, she knew it was the wise thing to do. Okay, um, there are a couple of other exercises here I'll go through fairly quickly. Turning inward exercises. So I mentioned when this client, um, when I ask her what does her wise mind tell her, that she turns inward. And that's, it. however you can get your client practicing turning inward, that's what we want. We want them looking inward to find that inner wisdom that we all have. And so one practice um, that uh, Marshall Linehan developed was the stone flake on a link. And here's the abbreviated version. This is an imagery exercise where you have your client imagining themselves as a stone flake that gets tossed out onto a lake. And they are lazily drifting, just floating. They're not drowning, they're not sinking. They're lazily floating downward. And that downward is going inward. So for some clients, that imagery gets them to turn inward and go down into their wise self. Um, similarly, going down a spiral staircase within, this isn't so much an image-oriented exercise as a, um, I believe Marcia calls it a kinesthetic exercise, where it's the sensation of going down within yourself as opposed to an image. It, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but again, the idea is you're turning inward, you're getting centered and grounded. Think of it that way too. Breathing exercises can also be helpful here. So you could have your client breathe in the word wise and breathe out the word mind. Uh, and so just in their head, right? So as they're breathing in, they just think to themselves wise. And as they breathe out, they're thinking the word mind. So they're focusing on turning inward and getting to wise mind. Um, so I'm looking at my client example here and uh, I obviously need to expand on that because I'm not sure what I meant by why. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, gonna skip over that. Um, okay, so often just helping our client or having our client be able to identify what state of mind they're in 
can help them take a step back if they are in a spot that's unhelpful for them and they need to access their wise mind. Often just being able to label I'm in wise, uh, reasoning mind or I'm in emotion mind helps them to take a step towards wise mind. However, you can help increase your client's awareness of what state of mind they're in just by having them pay attention. So the way I do this is I just, I'll just i give my client homework after I've taught them these three states. I'll say homework is just throughout the day, throughout the day just do your best to notice what state of mind you're in. Just ask yourself the question, where am I at? What state of mind am I in? Am I in wise mind? Just some version of that. Okay. And mindfulness and many of the other DBT skills that people are going to be learning help people get to wise mind. Um, now, skills that help people to um, reduce the likelihood of emotion mind taking over, uh, this is called the STRONG acronym. Now, for those of you who are using maybe DBT skills already, this is uh, what in DBT we call please master skills. But I've never liked the acronym please master, and so I found this one online many, many years ago, and I used the, the STRONG acronym instead. But really, these are the skills that are going to be included in any good psychotherapy where we go back to the basics, right? How often do we have to do this? We make sure that our clients are sleeping properly, not too much, not too little, but balancing, that they're taking their medications as prescribed for physical as well as mental health problems, that they're cutting down on substances and hopefully um, eliminating drugs and, and possibly alcohol. Um, the way I talk about this is that, I mean, they're mood-altering um, substances, right? We call them mood-altering substances for a reason. We have no control over how they alter our mood. And so when we have clients who are out of control with emotions on an ongoing basis, these are some really nice um, lifestyle changes, concrete lifestyle changes that people can make that could potentially help to reduce their vulnerability to being taken over by emotion mind. Okay, so that's how I get the, the buy-in from clients. Um, the O in our strong acronym stands for once a day build mastery. What that skill is, um, the, sometimes there's some confusion around uh, building mastery versus enjoyable activities. Building mastery is doing something that gives you a sense of mastering your world. Um, that helps you to feel a sense of accomplishment, that might give you a sense of feeling productive, or you might feel proud of yourself for having done what you did. Um, the activity that you do, it might not actually be enjoyable, but you feel good about yourself afterwards for having done it. And so an example that I'll often use here with my clients is vacuuming. I hate vacuuming, but I really like it when the vacuuming is done and the feeling that I get for having accomplished it and for the sense of cleanliness that I have around the house after that, right? So that would be building mastery. Um, again, though, this is going to be something that's different for every single client depending on where the client is. So when I have a client who is super depressed, so actually in group just this morning, uh, one client for build, building mastery for her was getting out of bed in the, in the morning, okay? versus letting herself just hang out there most of the day. So that's building mastery. For a client who's working full time, of course, going to work five days a week might be building mastery, or it might be going to the gym three days a week after work, or it, you know, it could really be anything. But you have to remember that this is gonna be based on where your client's at, and different for everyone. But the idea is getting that sense of accomplishment, okay? And it's not necessarily enjoyable. The other part to that is that um, it's not necessary that there is, um, uh, I, I want to say success in what the person was trying to do. So the trying might actually be the building mastery. So for example, if I have a client that I'm working with who decides that she's going to um, uh, um, try out for the school play, building mastery could be the tryout whether she gets into the school play or not. Okay, So really think broadly around that skill. Um, nutrition, of course, is another one where, again, going back to basics with our clients, right? Making sure they're eating three meals a day. Um, I love that the, uh, the word hangry is now in the dictionary, right? <laughs> because it really legitimizes this. So when you are not eating enough, your body is going to be responding in all sorts of different ways, and it's going to have an effect on you emotionally as well. So eating three meals a day is taking a more holistic approach to your um, 
mental health problems, whatever they are, and, and uh, it's going to make it less likely that those emotions take control at times. And then the exercise, of course, is the last one. Okay, so any questions? I'm just going to pause here for a second just to see if any questions are coming up for people. All right. So the what skills are the skills we're going to look at next here, the, set, the um, next set of core mindfulness skills. Um, observe and describe I'm going to do fairly quickly uh, because these really are mindfulness. Okay, observing is just noticing whatever your experience is. Um, it's just allowing yourself to sense. Uh, so, for example, if you're observing the sounds around you, just observe the sounds around you for a moment. Just notice. The idea here is that you're not putting labels on. Okay, putting labels on is describing. So observing is just allowing yourself to have the experience. Describing is putting words on the experience. Non-judgmental labels, okay? So you're not judging, you're just factually describing. Um, and this actually often helps bring some clarity to our experience, okay? So um, there's all sorts of things that you can do with clients to help them observe and describe. So you could do observing and describing the sounds in the room like we just did. Um, um, I mean, really, literally anything you can have your clients observing and describing. One typical one that I'll do is um, have people put their hand on the table be beside them if we're in group. Put the table on, put, you, put your hand on the table beside you. Just observe it without putting labels on. Just sense. And now, describe it. How does it feel? Well, it feels hard. It feels smooth. It feels warm. Okay, so that's observing and describing. Um, so there's a few different ways that I use observing and describing. Again, if you want, you can teach mindfulness in that specific way. Mindfulness is observing and describing. Um, typically what I do is I teach mindfulness in a more general sense, and I use the observing and describing if I have a client specifically who's struggling with mindfulness. It helps me break it down into smaller steps. So if I've tried a couple of different ways of teaching mindfulness and the person doesn't seem to be getting it, then I'll say, you know what, let's break it down into observing and describing, okay? Um, another time that I'll really turn to observing and describing is in relationships. So a client that I worked with a couple years ago who comes to mind, uh, she was struggling with a relationship with her new daughter-in-law. And she would personalize things and she would jump to conclusions and make all sorts of assumptions about this um, young woman's motives and so on. And so what I started doing with her, I taught her observing and describing. And each time she started jumping to conclusions, I would say, okay, hold on. Describe for me what you observed that's causing you to have these thoughts that her family is more important than your family or whatever the situation was, okay? So I would get her to break it down. Describe for me what you observed. So that helps people take a step back and does provide clarity because we're, we're basically looking for evidence, right? Um, and often that helps people see that they are jumping to conclusions and making assumptions, and so it helps to reduce the personalization. I also like to use this, I mentioned I don't like to do couple work, but when I do couple work, I help people uh, not, or to reduce at least the jumping to conclusions um, in their relationship with um, observing and describing. And by the way, of course, I'm not saying that they're wrong, right? Because their assumption or their conclusion could be absolutely accurate, but it helps if we can help them to take a step back and look at it more clearly. And then also you can check out with somebody. Okay, this is what I'm observing. Am I, am I correct in thinking that you're feeling angry with me right now because this is what I'm observing, okay? So it's not necessarily just leave it at the observe, describe, and assume that the client is wrong, but checking it out. All right. Now, participating is the third what skill, and this is where we're really becoming one with our experience. We're letting go of self-consciousness. We're letting go of worrying about what other people are going to think of us. We're letting go and just flowing with our activity that we're doing in the moment. Okay. Um, 
and this is really mindfulness um, when we're just fully participating. We're not thinking about the past, we're not thinking about the future, we're fully engaged in whatever it is that we're doing in that moment. Okay. So um, a couple of examples here, singing in the shower, uh, and actually these are, these are helpful ways of getting our clients to practice participating. So singing in the shower. If they have a hard time throwing themselves into activities, getting them to start off with um, activities that they're doing on their own can be really helpful. Dancing to music in their living room when there's nobody around, or singing in the car would be another one. Sometimes we experience these um, situations kind of spontaneously, right? So, for example, for me, and I'll, I, again, I like to share these examples with my clients. For me, um, when I've been scuba diving, it's a big time for me with participating. Um, but pretty much any time where I am in nature, I might have, an, have a participating experience. And a really important part of participating is feeling a sense of connectedness. Possibly to other people, but again, for me, when I'm in nature, for me, it's more a connection to, to the universe. To It could be a higher power. I'm not a religious person, but when I'm in nature, whether it's under the water or uh, walking in the forest with my dogs, I often just have that sense of peace and joy and a feeling of connection to just something. I can't really even give it a name. Okay, So for your religious or spiritual clients, it could be to God, it could be to the universe that people have that sense of connection. It could also be with other people depending on the experience that you're having. You could participate in a social event where you feel really connected with other people. Um, but the idea here is that sense of connection is so important. And this usually hits home for me more to when I have clients um, who really experience social anxiety. So extreme social anxiety where they don't have connections or they're very minimal um, and they feel so alone and isolated in their experience. Um, and um, that often is a recipe for disaster, right? That not being connected to other people. So participating, getting people to connect whether to other people or to the world in some way can be really helpful. Um, and then I've just got a couple questions here in terms of how do you connect? So just for you to be thinking about for your own experience, um, how do you connect to others or to the universe? And are, do you have experiences like this that you can share with your clients? Um, so Suzette's saying taking the class. Nice. Okay. I'm glad that's, that's a, a form of participating for you, Suzette. Yeah, being in nature, meditating, good. With animals, yes, Lorraine, nice. Um, I'm just going to go to somebody with a raised hand here. Oh, Suzette, I think, uh, Suzette, you already responded, but I'm going to come and take you off mute. Did you have something to add, Suzette? And I hope I can hear you this time. Mm. I'm, Suzette, are you there? I'm hearing something, but I'm not hearing you say anything. Oh, no thanks. Okay, I just saw your comment there. Okay. Yoga, hiking, yeah, good. So share these examples with your clients because we really want them to get how they can connect. Um, again, not necessarily with other people, but with the universe or, or something so that they know that they're not alone, right? Okay, now I, um, I'm i sorry, you guys. The videos uh, that I've tried to show here in the past, for some reason I can't get my sound working. I have a cute little um, video called Your Cat is Judging You. You can find it on YouTube, and it's just a quick little funny video that connects to our next skill, which is non-judgmental stance. Now, I want to make sure that we have enough time to spend here because this is a lengthy skill. Um, this is one of my favorite skills, and I always teach this skill to my clients who are angry. So when anger is a problem for my clients, I know right off the bat that this is a skill they're going to benefit from. But I would say probably 90% of my clients, if not more, um, that I teach this skill to. And again, this is one that I practice myself. So um, judgments increase the intensity of our emotions. So judgments, what we're talking about with judgments is this is a skill about semantics. This is the language that we use, the judgmental words 
Um, the inflammatory language, okay, so I think I'm just trying to give you some ways to think about this. Those words actually um, get us stuck usually in a vicious cycle of inflaming our emotions. Judgments add fuel to our emotional fire, okay? So um, if, you, if we can reduce the um, judgments that we're using, then we're going, and our clients, of course, we're going to, going to be able to reduce the intensity of emotions, maybe the number of emotions that are coming up. So in other words, especially when we're dealing with highly sensitive clients who are emotionally dysregulated quite often, this skill is a nice skill that's going to help to reduce that emotional intensity. Um, okay, so think, I'm going to give you some examples now and I'm going to give you some more later. Examples of judgmental words. Stupid, good, bad, right, wrong, ridiculous, crazy, um, terrific, wonderful, awesome, terrible, awful, miserable, okay? Those are the kinds of words we're looking at. What we want to do with this skill is we want to start taking those judgments out of our vocabulary. Oh, another one just popped into my mind. I had this discussion with colleagues this morning about the word manipulate. Blah, hate that word. Very judgmental. Usually, not every single time, but usually. Oh my gosh, Lorraine, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Con confefe, whatever that word is that's been going around, <laughs> right? Okay, I, I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope they don't add that one to the dictionary. God. All right, so we want to, <laughs> sorry, we want to take that word out of our vocabulary or out of the sentence that we're saying, sorry. And we want to expand on that to say what we really mean. So instead of, I think this is an example, I've gotten a slide um, or two. Uh, instead of saying, I'm lazy, this is one that I use that many of our clients can relate to. Okay, Think about that, saying that to yourself, I'm lazy. For most of our clients, for most people, I would say, that brings up, disappointment in myself, it makes me feel, yucky is the word I want to say, but I, if I was my client, I would say back to me that yucky isn't an emotion, right? So what's the feeling that comes up? Angry at myself, um, maybe hopeless. So the word lazy generates all sorts of emotions. So I'm lazy. We want to take the word lazy out. and So think of that word lazy as a short form. Take it out and say what you really mean. What's the long version? What am I really trying to say? So maybe in this instance, what I'm really trying to say is, um, I didn't get everything done that I wanted to do today, and I'm feeling disappointed in myself. Okay. So the recipe I think of it as for a non-judgmental statement is, what are the facts of the situation, and what are your feelings about it? So I didn't get everything done that I wanted to do today, and I felt disappointed in myself. We are not, with this skill, with any skill in DBT, we're not trying to make pain disappear. We're not trying to get rid of emotions. But what this skill does is it helps prevent us from escalating. Okay. So if I am disappointed in myself, I'm still going to feel disappointed in myself. Being non-judgmental about it isn't going to take that disappointment away. What it does do is it stops the escalation of emotions. I'm not disappointed and now angry and feeling guilty and ashamed and so on. Okay, so it stops here. It's also, of course, going to help us be more effective in interpersonal situations. If I have an 18 year old son and I'm arguing with him and calling him lazy, that's not going to feel very good either, right? So that's going to cause problems in relationships. So if I can say, instead of you are being lazy, if I take that word out, expand on it, what do I really mean? I mean I'm feeling frustrated because I've asked you three times to clean your room and you still haven't done it. Okay, So it's not going to take the feeling away, but it helps prevent it from escalating. Um, now, sometimes judgments are necessary, but I've come to relabel those judgments as evaluations. So judgment versus evaluation, what are we talking about there? We're talking uh, evaluation would be, is this webinar helpful or not helpful? Um, is the relationship that you're in satisfying or not satisfying? 
is um, it safe or not safe to go through the light that just turned yellow as you're driving down the road, okay? So those would be evaluations. Judgments would be, uh, this webinar is awesome, or um, this relationship is terrible, or um, the stupid light just turned yellow as I was on my way through it, okay? So those are the judgments. Remember, this is a skill that's really about semantics. Now, positive judgments, though. Um, judgments aren't always negative, of course. I know that's what we've been focusing on, and that tends to be what I'm typically concerned with with my clients because it's the negative judgments that tend to be triggering, right? The only problem with positive judgments um, is that what is good can turn into bad, okay? So if I have a friend, oh, actually, I'll use this. If I have a therapist who is this amazing therapist, she's so good, and I've never worked with anybody as good as she is, and she totally understands me, and she's there for me when I need her. Well, what if that therapist then suddenly can't be there when I need her? Is she now an awful therapist, okay? So what starts out good can turn into a negative. So we want to be cautious around that. I'm not saying that we can't tell people that they're wonderful friends or, or you know, tell children how wonderful they are or so on, right? But we need to be aware of the possible effects and the long-term consequences of that positive turning into a negative. The challenge of self-judgments. So, so many of the clients that I see, um, I've become much more aware over the years of shame. And this is something that I think is very connected to shame, is the self-judgments. And so this is one of my strategies that I use when I have clients um, where shame is really a big problem. So working on self-judgments, though, is really challenging because um, often they're kind of running on a tape in the back of our head, so it's much harder to catch them, right? Um, it's just a theme that goes over and over and over. So they're harder to catch. Also, we tend to not say them out loud nearly as often, right? Um, but they, I think of them as us verbally abusing ourselves. That's how I put it to my clients. So um, what I actually ask people to do when self-judgments are a real problem is actually to put them on the back burner to start with. I want my clients to get some experience and practice with judgments of other people, judgments of situations, just judgments in general. And then once they feel more comfortable with that and they're able to turn judgments into non-judgments, then I want them to start working on the self-judgments more um, intricately. Okay, so the, the self-judgments, though, can be really tough. Uh, one thing that's also helpful when I'm working a lot with self-judgments is I'll get somebody to write out non-judgmental statements to themselves and practice that, so that becomes their new self-talk over time. Uh, so if it's a theme of, I'm a bad mom, or I'm, I'm not, uh, or I'm a bad daughter, I'm not being there for my parents as much as I should be, something like that. Um, it, whatever the theme is, um, then have them write out some non-judgmental statements about that, okay, to help them change the self-talk. Non-verbal judgments. Um, so first of all, we're talking about judgments that we say out loud, we're also talking judgments that go through our head. Same thing, whether we say them out loud or just think them, they're still going to trigger our emotions, right? So it doesn't matter if it's one or the other. We want to really work on this with both. Um, but the other part to nonverbal judgments is what I think of as um, that it's not always the words themselves that we're using that are judgmental, but the attitude with which we say them, okay? So the discussion I had this morning with a colleague around the word manipulate, she's working with a client who described himself as a, I, I'm not sure if he used the word, I'm the words I'm a manipulator or I try to manipulate people, but it actually sounded like he was being non judgmental and he was just saying, it's a fact that I try to manipulate people. Okay? But typically, that's not how we use the word. And so that's why I cringe, but sometimes it's about checking these things out with our clients to see are they actually judging or not? Because it's not always so black and white. Um, sometimes it's the tone of our voice, okay, so if I said, um, actually I can see my painting on the wall behind me, I don't know if you can see it, not that it matters, there's my painting, um, but if I said, um, I really like the painting on the wall, emotions by the way are non-judgmental, so my expressing like for something isn't a judgment, it's just my personal preference, 
So if I said, I really like the painting on the wall, that would be non-judgmental. But if I said, wow, I really like the painting on the wall, then that is now a judgment, okay? So it's my tone of voice. It's also my, maybe my facial expression. Actually, if you look at me for a minute, I'll try and do this so you can see me, okay? This, in case you didn't see that, I just rolled my eyes. You can never roll your eyes non-judgmentally, okay? Eye rolls are judgments. Okay, so just some examples of how nonverbal judgments can happen. Sometimes judgments are hard to catch. Um, so it might be those, those judgments that really fall into that gray area. Um, and so the, the key there is really just questioning, being curious about them, especially if it's with a client. We don't want to assume that the client's being judgmental, but we do want to be curious about it. And so the last point on here, awareness equals choice. We are not trying to get rid of judgments. We're not trying to eradicate them. A, it's impossible, okay, and B, it's, it's not necessary. Uh, sometimes we judge and it's not triggering. You can go into the grocery store, pick up the tomato and say, wow, this tomato is bad and put it back, okay? It's not going to trigger emotions for most people if they say the tomato is bad. You don't have to say, well, the tomato is kind of blue and moldy and it probably wouldn't taste good. Okay, so it's not about eradicating judgments, but for our clients and for ourselves, when we notice that emotions are escalating, um, if we can identify that this emotion seems to be kind of out of sync with the situation I'm dealing with, it seems more intense than what is warranted by the situation, then we can have the option now of looking to our thoughts and, and trying to change judgments that we notice are there. Okay, so awareness equals choice. Okay, so the example I've got here, I gave you the lazy example already. Uh, the other example, he's an idiot versus he hurt me and I'm feeling angry with him. Okay, so there you can see again how we're not going to escalate our emotions, but also how uh, the second one, he hurt me and I'm feeling angry with him, is likely to go better in a relationship situation, right? You hurt me and I'm feeling angry with you instead of you idiot. It also provides more information to the person. If I said you're an idiot, you probably or might not, maybe you'll know what I'm talking about, but you might not know what, why I'm calling you an idiot. You might have no idea what you've done. Whereas if I say, you hurt me and I'm feeling angry with you, I'm being more clear, I'm giving you information. What this skill is not, it's not rationalizing or excusing behavior. So um, the way I think of this, and my clients laugh at me when I say this, but I tell my clients, I want you to say exactly the same thing. I want you to call the guy an idiot, but take the word idiot out and say the long version. Okay? We are not trying to rationalize or excuse behavior. So you're an idiot isn't going to become, well, maybe he was feeling really tired and so he lashed out at me. No, that's not what we want. We want he said something hurtful and I'm angry. We don't want to, we don't want the why. We don't care so much about the why. Remember, because this is about reducing our emotional pain or preventing it from escalating. When I say maybe uh, he's really tired tonight and so maybe that's why he said something hurtful, the add-on, the kind of unspoken thing at the end of that sentence is, therefore, I shouldn't be feeling angry. Okay, so now I'm invalidating my emotions and that's going to escalate me also. So that's one of the reasons why we're not looking for rationalizations or excuses. It's also not providing reassurance. So to go back to I'm lazy, the example here would be, it's okay that I didn't get everything done today, I can work on it tomorrow. That's not a non-judgmental statement. Now that doesn't mean we're going to tell our client to not do that, right? If they find that helpful, if they can provide that reassurance to themselves, then that's totally fine. We're not trying to fix what's not broken. Um, but that would not be a non-judgmental statement. That's what I want to be clear about here. Uh, some helpful alternatives that you can give to your clients to replace judgments is, is it helpful or not helpful? Is it effective or not? Safe versus unsafe or dangerous? Um, satisfying versus unsatisfying? And healthy versus unhealthy? Uh-oh. Okay, Kara doesn't have sound. Uh, has everybody else got sound? I'm not seeing no sound from anyone else. Francis has sound. Okay. Okay. Everybody else has sound. I'm just going to quickly type back to Kara. Thanks, you guys. Oh, Kara's back. Okay. Just as I finished typing that. 
All right, good. I'm glad you're back, Kara. Okay, so I better move along here a little bit, you guys. One mindfully we're actually not going to spend time on. This is the how skills. Um, and sorry, actually, I didn't mention this. The first set of skills is the what skills, what you do. The how skills are how you do the what skills. Um, and all of those skills combined equal mindfulness. Okay, so one mindfully is really just more mindfulness. It's doing one thing at a time with your full attention. It's not multitasking, okay? Effectively is about focusing on what works. It's the opposite of cutting off your nose to spite your face, okay? It's acting skillfully. Um, it's acting from your wise mind and doing what you need to do from your wise mind in order to get your needs met. Um, I'm just going to pause for a question here from Terry. How do you help someone really get past their extreme anger and disagreement for their boss? They have a career and love their job, but her feelings strongly get in the way. Great question, Terry. Um, so non-judgmental stance will help with that. Um, you need to do a lot of explaining the rationale and that we're not trying to get the anger to go away, but to um, prevent the extra anger kind of is how I think of it. So presumably there's been a situation that's triggered the anger to begin with. There also might be some radical acceptance to happen here. Um, radical acceptance is another DBT skill that I cover in the distress tolerance module. Um, but also skills like mindfulness, being aware of the reaction so that she can then use skills like non-judgmental stance, like um, accessing her wise mind, not letting the anger control her, those kinds of things. And then of course there might be some, uh, and again it's gonna depend on the situation, there might be some interpersonal effectiveness skills that need to be used here in order to address whatever the problem is with the boss, right? Uh, so this is a great example of how skills don't happen in a vacuum. Um, we're often combining all sorts of skills together to help our clients deal with stuff, just depending on the situation. Okay, thanks for that, Terry. Great, you're welcome. Okay, so uh, back to effectively. Um, it's about doing what you need to do in order to get your needs met, but remember from your wise mind, right? So it's not, this doesn't give us or our clients free reign to do whatever, like to lie, steal, and cheat to get what they want, right? It's about figuring out what are my long-term goals and what is, um, what, what do I need to do that's going to be most likely to get me there? So the example that I use here with my clients is um, when I was leaving a job many years ago, uh, here's where you watch me practice non-judgmental stance. Every time I tell this story, I had a boss who um, did not treat many of us very respectfully, and she had done a lot of things that had hurt a lot of people. Okay, that was my non-judgmental stance with my boss. And so, uh, when I was um, potentially leaving that position, I would have loved to have told her where to go, but I needed a reference letter on my way out, and so. I went in, I asked for my reference letter, I gave my two weeks notice, I did what I needed to do to get my long-term need met, even though it would have been very satisfying to tell her what I really thought of her. We're also a very small community, so I didn't want to burn bridges just in case was the other part to that. So there were kind of two long-term goals there. But cutting off your nose to spite your face is not being effective. It's following the short-term uh, satisfaction and putting aside your long-term goals, okay? So think of it as, is it better for you to be right or for you to get what you want or what you need? Okay. Um, often what gets in the way of us being effective is that we act in accordance with the way, uh, we act as though things are the way we think they should be instead of the way things actually are, okay? So, uh, for example, a client starting a new job, they've been there for, say, six months now, and they're saying, damn it, I need a raise, I should get a raise, they've told me that they're really happy with my work, but they're not giving me a raise. And then the therapist might say, well, have you asked for a raise? And the response is, well, I shouldn't have to ask, they should just give it to me, right? That's being ineffective. That's cutting off your nose to spite your face. So being effective means that you stop focusing on what you think should be, what you think is fair or right, and you focus instead on reality as it actually is. And then that's how you make your decisions, based on reality as it is. Okay, so that is the skill of effectively. 
look at that. That timing was pretty darn good, I have to say. So the four modules in DBT, just got another question coming up here. Uh, Lisa is saying, earlier you mentioned mindfulness helping with chronic pain. Can I expand on that for sure? Um, so uh, first off, so I can say lots about that. Tell me when you've had enough. Um, there is a lovely book written by Dr. Jackie Gardner hyphen Nix. So Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R hyphen N-I-X. And it's called The Mindfulness Solution to Pain. And she has created a group, the chronic, Mindfulness-Based Chronic Pain Management Chronic Pain Management Group, that's based on John Kabat-Zinn's MBSR. Um, and uh, it's a 13-week long group that focuses on teaching clients uh, how to use mindfulness to help basically change their relationship to the pain. So what they've actually found with that group is that sometimes people, are, and I can't tell you the actual uh, statistics on this, but statistically um, significant results in reducing medications for chronic pain. One way that, that mindfulness helps with chronic pain um, is to, ch to change the relationship to the pain in the sense of reducing our anger around it, actually. This has been my experience, personally and with work working with clients, um, that our tendency is, of course, to fight the pain, right? We, we don't want this, we're suffering, and so we fight the pain in some way, you know, in our thoughts, in our, you know, not listening to our bodies and doing, overdoing things and so on, pretending it's not there, ignoring it, whatever. And um, often in fighting the pain, we do more damage either by overdoing it or by getting angry and worked up about it, right? And of course, when we get angry, we tense up and that makes the pain more pronounced. So with mindfulness, tuning into our body, listening to what our body's telling us, um, balancing, finding more of a balance um, in that regard, and being more accepting of the experience helps us to not uh, have that same anger experience with the, with the pain, uh, which helps our body to not tense up and therefore doesn't feed into that cycle, right? So acceptance of the pain, I find, is a really big um, part of how mindfulness is helpful. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, I am going to open up for questions in general at this point. So this is just an overview of the DBT skills again. Um, at this point, the modules that I do through TZK, um, I have a, 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 it's not on here because it's a general mind, introduction to mindfulness. I do a three-hour general intro to mindfulness that's available. But then the DBT modules, I have core mindfulness. Uh, sorry, that's the one we're doing now. I have emotion regulation. I have distress tolerance. And I have um, a general introduction to DBT. I haven't done interpersonal effectiveness yet, mainly because it's just uh, really a lot of assertiveness stuff. I think they're very helpful skills. I've just kind of left them on the back burner. OK, so the core mindfulness skills, um, if you are teaching uh, DBT skills in group, they are always the first set of skills taught. Um, and almost always, these are the first skills that I teach my clients, or I might not teach all of them, but I start with mindfulness with clients in individual sessions. And the one exception to that so far, there might be other times when I make exceptions to this, but usually the only exception to that is when I have a client who's actively engaging in a problem behavior that is uh, really concerning, so a self-harming behavior or substance use or something like that, that I see as potentially getting in the way of therapy, either because they end up dead or they end up dropping out of therapy or uh, it's interfering with their ability to practice skills and that kind of thing. And if that's the case, then I'll teach um, distress tolerance skills first. But usually I only do that when it's self-harming behavior um, because really the core mindfulness skills are core and it's really helpful for clients to learn these skills that we've just done before moving on to other skills. Um, okay, so Kara's just asking, we talked a lot about emotion mind. At one point though, it sounded like rational mind could be a bad thing too. Can't being in rational mind help you battle lots of different kinds of irrational and healthy thinking patterns? Kara, I would actually consider what you said at the end there, wise mind, probably not reasoning mind, okay? Yes, reasoning mind can be unhelpful, um, but also there are times absolutely when we need it. 
When we're there too much, that's the problem. If we spend too much time in emotion mind or reasoning mind, it's going to become a problem. Okay, but uh, when you say can't being in rational mind help us battle lots of different kinds of irrational, unhealthy thinking patterns, I would think that typically that's going to be wise mind, where you're feeling the feelings that are associated with those unhealthy, irrational thoughts, and you're able to think more wisely about those thoughts, okay? So I don't really see that so much as reasoning mind. But absolutely, yes, we do want to be in reasoning mind sometimes, and sometimes it's going to be unhelpful when we're there too much. Emily's asking, do you ever incorporate mindfulness meditation techniques? At what point is this not advised or is it triggering? Great question, Emily. Um, DBT focuses more on um, Zen mindfulness, this is something I talk about in my mindfulness webinar. I'll try and make this brief. Zen mindfulness, um, as opposed to Vipassana mindfulness, which is the more meditative strategies and techniques that are used in MBSR, MBCT, those kinds of um, um, tech, um, therapeutic uh, models. So DBT is based more on the Zen practices which are really about um, incorporating mindfulness into daily life as opposed to formal sitting practices, okay? So um, yes, though, I do emphasize a focus on both. So I do try to get clients practicing formally because there's certainly benefits to it. There's tons of research, and all of the research that's out there about mindfulness, of course, is on the formal mindfulness sitting practices, right? Um, however, in my experience, some clients just completely are not open to doing what we call meditation or formal mindfulness practices, right? Um, and I would much rather have somebody doing some mindfulness instead of no mindfulness. I also find it's a nice starting point as an introduction to mindfulness. I'll get people, I always start with informal practices. So I'll get people driving mindfully, walking mindfully, sitting with their pets mindfully, um, helping their kids with homework mindfully. I focus on that first. And then hopefully I can get them to build up to mindful, formal mindfulness practices because they're seeing how effective the informal practices are. Okay, but that's uh, that's my own personal style too. Um, so certainly if you know if you do things the other way around and it works for you, then that's wonderful. Okay, so I'm still here for questions, you guys. It is 3:52, so I'll be here for another eight minutes. Uh, I see a question come up. I'm just going to remind people here about getting your certificate. So uh, you need to go to the TZK Seminars website, uh, sign in, complete the validation test and the webinar evaluation, and then you can download your certificate. And I will be here um, for another eight minutes to answer questions. Oh, okay, Emily's just saying thanks. You're welcome, Emily. Uh, and if you are leaving, I want to say thank you. It's been wonderful having you here this afternoon. And uh, I'll just uh, take questions for the remainder at this point. You're welcome, Kelly. Okay, good. Thanks, Francis. Have a good afternoon. Uh, Kara, don't apologize, Kara. I love questions. What a stronger focus on changing irrational or unhealthy thoughts so that they don't negatively affect emotions be more CBT focused. Well, uh, DBT is a CBT therapy, Kara. Um, so you can certainly bring in CBT techniques and strategies if you're primarily a CBT therapist. One thing that I really like about DBT is that it goes very well with other therapies. You can bring in strategies and techniques from DBT and weave them in with the techniques that you're already using. Um, so you could certainly um, use your traditional CBT uh, techniques there. Um, but in my mind, changing irrational thoughts and unhealthy thoughts so that they don't negatively affect emotions, that is non-judgmental stance. That is observing and describing. That is being mindful to the experience. Um, so, so in my mind, that is still DBT as well. But certainly you can bring in those other more CBT-focused um, uh, specific uh, techniques as well. Okay? Good. Excellent. Thanks, Terry. You're welcome, Renee. Yes, Pam, great to connect to Canada as well. Yeah, that's funny. 
Pam, I'm just wondering if you can uh, just tell me where you're located in Canada. I'm just curious. Um, Monica, yes, the slides are available. So two ways. If you have the link to connect to the webinar still, um, the PowerPoint slides were, um, th there's a link on that email to connect you to the slides. Or in your control panel, there's a section that says handouts. And uh, yeah, so you can also click on the, on the control panel where it says handouts, and I've attached the handouts there as well. Amaya is asking, can I suggest resources for teaching teens and children DBT skills? Uh, so Amaya, I have written a book for teens, so I would say like 12 and older, called Don't Let Your Emotions Run Your Life for Teens. That's a workbook. Uh, it's my bestseller, and um, I th it's got lots of nice uh, exercises and worksheets and that kind of thing in it. Uh, for children, I can't really, there haven't really been any helpful, any books written about DBT for kids, but it is being adapted. Um, and I'm trying to, I always forget her name. There is a psychologist in the U.S. She's, I think, Russian, and she has a very long name. If you want to email me, Amaya, I can at least point you in the direction of her research, which might be a helpful start for you, okay? Per, per, Perplechkova, something like that. If you Google DBT and just type in um, P-E-R-P, uh, yeah, that's the best I can do right now. But if you if you can't find it, send me an email. My email's on your first slide, and uh, and I'm happy to look that up for you. Okay, good. Um, Pam, oh, you're in Florida now. Okay, all of your family's in Toronto and Ottawa. Nice. Okay, well, nice to meet you, Pam. Thanks for letting me know that. I'm I'm just north of Toronto. Okay, you're welcome, Amalia. Oh, just north of Toronto, Pam. That's funny. I'm um, so I'll just let you know that I'm just uh, in between Newmarket and Barrie, if you're familiar with the area. So I'm about an hour and a quarter north of Toronto. It'd be funny if if we know each other somehow. Oh, uh, Karen, no, I did not see your final question. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry, it it ran past me. So wise mind really means that you're trying to have a healthy balance between the thoughts and emotions. Um, i.e. thought regulation slash assessment drives healthy feelings. Um, yes, and don't forget that intuition, that gut instinct, that just knowing part. But yes, it, so it's the combination of thoughts and emotions, so reasoning, thinking, and emotions, and that uh, this is just what's in my best interest to do at this point. I hope that makes sense, Kara. Thanks for clarifying. And thanks for pointing out your question that I missed. Nice, Pam. Well, you haven't been missing the rain that we've had up here, Pam. It's been the wettest spring, I think, that we've ever had from what they're saying. So I hope you're enjoying Florida. You're welcome, Laura. Thank you. Oh, great, Kara. I'm glad that was helpful. Good. I hope to see you again. Take care. Oh, you're getting rain too, Pam. Okay, uh, Kelly, how do you get to the test? You tried to go online and you didn't see a link. So this is how, on this slide, did you go to tzkseminars.com? So go back to their website, and then there's a spot there for you to sign in with your email address and password. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can find that. Okay, Louisiana, rain too. Wow, all over the place, eh? Okay, no problem, Carol. What's your question? Oh, the link is broken. You guys are having a broken link. Okay. Um, Kara's asking, can we take the test later today or do we have to take it now? Oh, Kara, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. All your seminars are gone that you've done before. I'm not sure what that means, Joshua. I, I haven't done seminars through TZK, so do you, is it like an archive or something? So maybe TZK is having a problem with, um, with their website or something today, you guys. I'm not sure what to tell you. Obviously, so please don't stress, okay, because 
uh, yeah, don't feel anxious. We are going to get it sorted out, even if this means that you have to do the, the evaluation test at some point later. Okay, so Joshua said, okay, so it could just be that TZK is having technology problems today, you guys. So please do not stress. My experience with TZK is that they fix things as soon as possible and they will get it sorted out for you. So all you need to do is send them an email. Uh, okay, that's a good question, Kelly. They don't send me a code. Does any, so Kelly's asking what was the code of this test to refer to so that she can contact TZK. If anybody knows what the code is, if you can type it in, because I don't have that information. Oh, and Joshua is just clarifying that you can take the test anytime you want. It doesn't have to be right after the seminar. Thanks for letting me know that, Joshua, and to pass that on to everybody. Yeah, so that should be fine. Um, if, if you have problems, you guys, first thing is email TZK, and they should take care of it right away. But if for some reason they don't, then by all means send me an email. Again, my email is on your very first slide and I will help you get it sorted out. But TZK is very responsive and they want you to come back. So they're going to fix things so that there's no problem. So please don't stress. Okay, everybody, I have a couple minutes after four, so I need to vacate at this point. Uh, if you have any problems, again, feel free to send me an email um, if you're not getting anywhere with um, TZK, but I, I have every confidence that that won't happen. So thank you again all, and uh, have a great afternoon. Okay, take care.